All right. Um, in uh, noon here in North Carolina. Oh, there's somebody from Uruguay. Oh, regards from Uruguay, Gustavo Rodriguez. Okay. Hey, uh, be nice if you guys can uh, either in the chat or in the QA, uh, just shout out where you are uh, connecting from. That will be great. Uh, so we have uh, somehow of a feeling where people is connecting from. But welcome to the first International Plant Breeding Seminar organized by uh, North Carolina State University. Um, please post your, your questions in the QA, um, but you can post comments in the chat, okay? We'll, we'll try to manage both channels simultaneously. Uh, the idea for this series has been to uh, have a, 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 an avenue to learn, to exchange ideas and to hopefully build collaborations into the future. So uh, welcome and, and we welcome ideas. We welcome uh, good, great participation. Today we have Dr. Craig Yencho, uh, who is a distinguished professor here at our horticulture uh, science department at NC State. Um, he's the leader of the sweet potato and potato breeding and genetics program, okay? Uh, he uh, previously uh, served uh, a short uh, period at SEAT and also as part of the Peace Corps in, in the Caribbean. And uh, uh, I, I tend to think that that uh, brief periods of international exposure shaped in part uh, his career and his uh, uh, openness to collaborate internationally. He graduated from uh, uh, Cornell with a PhD at Cornell and with a master's from uh, Washington State University. Grew up in a small town in Pennsylvania as part of a family that uh, dealt with trucks and buses. And he says that that also has helped him a lot in his professional career. Uh, thanks so much, Craig, for accepting this uh, challenge and I look forward to the presentation. Again, uh, please post your questions uh, in the QA throughout the uh, presentation. Thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot, uh, uh, Carlos. I, I really appreciate that introduction. And I don't know if many of you have heard the music that was playing right before this, this uh, the seminar introduction. I've got to be honest, it actually brings a little bit of a tear to my eye, uh, realizing all the friends and, uh, and all the places that, uh, that all of us have been missing this this last year so uh, I'm looking forward to getting back at it uh, I'll start right in I'll share my screen and again I want to say it's a real honor uh, to be able to lead off this talk uh, today uh, Carlos I, I, I really really thank you and the, the title of my talk is I'm gonna try and get this screen on my way here real quick you guys can't see it, but I can. Give me a sec. Uh, go to pointer. All right. Oh, now I'll grab it here and just kind of put it on this side. Yeah, there we go. All right. So the title of my talk today is uh, Sweet Potato Breeding and International Ag Development, Local and Global Benefits. And uh, There we go. Uh, what I want to do is, is, is give you some thoughts on the so-called grand challenges uh, through my lens as a breeder working on so-called orphan crop. Um, I want to say we live in a small, but we all know that it's a very, very complicated world. Uh, I think Zoom has kind of shown how small it really can be. Uh, prior to, to this, I, I think many of us travel globally quite a bit, and uh, we, we all realize how small it actually is. Uh, as I've gotten older, I've been thinking a lot more about how we nurture and feed the world in the future. And uh, there's a huge amount of, of literature available out there, but I've come across a couple of, of key uh, publications here, mostly from the U.S. perspective right now, the land-grant university perspective that that I'd like to share with you that I've used as some of my background thoughts. One is this National Academy of uh, Sciences, Engineering and Medicine consensus report on, on science breakthroughs needed to advance food and ag research by 2030. Another one is the challenge of change, which is a put out by the Association of Public Land Grant Universities. Actually, our chancellor here, Dr. Randy Woodson, 
is uh, was the lead editor of, of this one, which is specific towards uh, the land grant universities. And then back in 2014, the National Research Council came out with this challenge for sustainable food, food security of all. And actually, uh, one of our faculty here at NC State, I, I think was a key uh, part of this, of this putting this together was, was Dr. Julia Cornegay. Uh, you know, you can group our challenges into, you know, several areas uh, around availability, around access, around utilization. And today, I think I'm going to focus mainly on availability and primarily on challenge two, uh, which will transect with challenge one. But I realize that all of these areas here are, are really have to come together to food, uh, to feed the world. And I just don't have time to go into that today, but I, I, I'll, I'll touch base on a couple of thoughts on that as I go through the talk. A couple of basic statistics. Uh, our world population is now clocking in at about 7.7 .7 billion. Out of a population of 7 billion, roughly 2 billion people suffer from micronutrient malnutrition and about 800 million people from calorie deficiency. Uh, so it, it's a serious problem. It's a serious problem here in the United States, as well as globally, too. Uh, when you're looking at the generation and distribution of food insecurity uh, by severity, you can see that it varies greatly across the regions of the world. But the thing that this figure sort of points out to me is that really uh, food insecurity and severe food insecurity is distributed across the globe. Uh, we even have it here in certain regions of North Carolina uh, in tier what we call the tier one counties. Uh, it's been exacerbated by the pandemic. Uh, it's a real problem that we recognize. Uh, so it's, it's, it's across the globe. Uh, but if you kind of laser in on a continent that I've done a fair amount of work in is, is Africa, proportionately, you're going to see that proportionately moderate or severe food insecurity and severe food insecurity proportionally is really a, a big, big, big problem in Africa. Uh, and the other thing that strikes me as I travel the globe is the concept of, well, you know, global population growth. And I'm a very visual person. Uh, I found these figures to be fairly instructive on, on from World Mapper. Uh, just kind of, it kind of, visualizes what our population is like uh, currently in 2018. I think we all recognize that the Asia has a huge population, roughly a third of the, of the global population is in Asia. Africa, very big, you know, North and South America, Europe, somewhat smaller. Uh, move to 2050, and you can see that that population is growing. It's continuing to grow in, in, in 2050, and everybody here is a, you know, 9 billion by 2050 figures. But move out even further, uh, to 2100, roughly 100 years from now, and you can see how big of a problem that not only uh, feeding a continent is going to be, but the population growth. And one of the things that always strikes me is when I return to Africa, and geez, I hope I can be able to do that here sometime this fall, is the massive number of youth and the massive number of people, no matter where you go, uh, you're always going to find people. So population growth is something that we're all going to be wrestling with in the future. And even more importantly, is, is how we're going to feed uh, this growing population and sustain our environment uh, and, and deal with all the other issues that come along with that. Um, in terms of global productivity, one thing that stands out to me is both the productivity measures in terms, in terms of kilograms of carbon per meter, meter squared uh, of South America and Africa, they're really productive regions. You know, they're, they're along the equator in the subtropics, uh, hugely productive. And that leads me to the question as to, you know, how can we channel that productivity in good ways, in sustainable ways uh, to feed and sustain the, the growing, the gro our growing globe and our growing population? Uh, so I'll boil down our challenges and opportunities into this figure here really quickly. Uh, we're all, we're all gonna be meeting increased production on marginal land, more pests and diseases, stressed nutrient and water resources in the context of global warming and climate change, uh, increasing urbanization, poverty and hunger-driven strife uh, is a real world issue. 
And in the background of this, we're, we're, we're kind of working with reduced federal, state, and actually global support. Uh, and all through this, and this is something that I've really become keenly aware in this area of big data, is our increased system science and data complexity that we're, we're all as scientists, uh, particularly my breeding colleagues, all wrestling with. And I'm kind of happy today to sort of sensitize the, the group here to these issues that we're wrestling with as we move forward in this really interesting series of seminars that, that Carlos has put together for us. Uh, we have a lot of strong, I'll call them headwinds, that are going to challenge us as we try and strive to meet these new opportunities. Uh, most of which is public distrust of science, uh, continue, continuing corporate consolidation. Uh, I don't know how many of us are actually managing grants and contracts. I think probably a lot of us. Uh, increased accountability and administrative burden is a real problem for us. Labor is an issue for many of our growers here in the United States. Uh, our public's connection to the land is minimal here, especially in a developed world. And you have this you know, inbred fear of GMOs. Uh, and all of these are kind of making the job a little bit tougher. But I generally try to adopt a positive uh, attitude. And I also say that we actually have some strong tailwinds with us too. And the human species as a whole is we're innovators. Uh, we have new tools, new exciting tools that are available to us, particularly as breeders, uh, particularly those of us who work in crop production, that really, I think, are going to help us meet the challenge moving forward. Uh, new gene editing, new ways of reducing genomic uh, cycle times, uh, new ways of accessing, visualizing, understanding big data, and using this to, to increase value advances in engineering and mechanization. I work more and more with engineers than I ever have in my whole career uh, to actually do high throughput phenotyping and analysis. Uh, so we have a lot of positives going for us. The question is how to channel them. Then we have these other factors down here, which I, I, I put this into this nebula area. And in certain cases, social media is wonderful. Uh, certainly today, we're all experiencing increased connectivity. I don't know how many people are currently on the talk right now, but I hear it's, 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 it's closer to 100 or maybe even more. Uh, and then you have these things, the political winds, where, where, where the winds are blowing, it's, you know, whether uh, it's, it, it's actually helps us to do our job or whether it hinders us. Uh, these are some, some complexities here. So this sort of sets the context in which I view my operating environment right now. Uh, and and uh, I'd like to share some of the research that I'm engaged with with sort of this in the, in the context. Uh, so let's take a look a little bit deeper at sweet potato production. Sweet potato is a global crop, of course, uh, six and most, well, six ranked in terms of total production globally. Uh, it's a tropical crop. And what I can see here is that uh, each dot here represents roughly a thousand hectares of sweet potato production. And the things that really jump out at me really quickly is that, is that China is a global leader in sweet potato production. They produce roughly about 60%, 60, 70% of the global crop. Sweet potatoes are really important across Sub-Saharan Africa, but our yields and our yield potential is actually very low. And I'll come back to this figure a little bit later. I, I would, never would have guessed this uh, when I started my career about 25 years ago. Uh, we have active collaborations here at NC State on six continents and sweet potato uh, research has taken me around the globe many, many, many times. I, I, I dare say my carbon footprint is not good because of that, but I'm hoping that some of the work that we do offsets at least some of that. So we have very active collaborations around the globe in sweet potato and I've really valued those collaborations over the years. And one of our points here to talk is to connect uh, our local research with the global and to show how they've been really mutually beneficial throughout my career. And I think they're benefiting the crop both locally and globally. Uh, that takes me to North Carolina. Uh, many of you may not be familiar with North Carolina, but agriculture in North Carolina is important. It's a critical industry to our state. It's our number one industry. It accounts for roughly 18 to 20% of our gross state product. 
North Carolina is a, is a biotech sector and the confluence of biotech with ag tech really, I think makes us a really, really important state in terms of driving advances in ag biotechnology forward. Uh, we're very fortunate as faculty here at NC State to benefit from an ag research station network. Uh, these are the 18 research stations scattered throughout uh, North Carolina. And I really feel that our research station network and the work we do on farm and in uh, the research stations is, uh, is one of the strongest in the US. We're really, really very fortunate to have this research station network in collaboration with the North Carolina Department of Agriculture and Consumer Sciences. Uh, as I look at things, uh, I also think that North Carolina represents a microcosm of our global issues. Our growers are wrestling, are wrestling with the changing climate. Uh, we're wrestling with increasing periods of high temperatures, increasing lengths of drought, but we also, also have this thing called hurricanes or typhoons, as many of you might refer to it, where we can have a very droughty year, but we can have during the harvest time, a hurricane that will come in off the, off the East Coast and we'll be suffering from flooding. Uh, so simultaneously, uh, we have these conflicting uh, droughts, but also we need to breed for flooding tolerance additionally. And a changing climate seems to be exacerbating this. Many of you also might not realize, but the transect across North Carolina represents a change in elevation to about maybe a thousand meters from the coastal plains up into the mountains of North Carolina. All different soil types, all different temperature regimes and planting times. And this really makes North Carolina a bit of a microcosm of, of the globe. And I, I kind of view my research here in that context. Uh, my two crops, just to give you an idea where, where we stand with that, sweet potato uh, ranks sixth most important globally, the other crop, potato, fourth. Uh, our North Carolina rank, uh, North Carolina is the largest producer of sweet potatoes in the United States. We produce anywhere from 50 to maybe 60% of the crop of sweet potatoes in North Carolina currently. Uh, the U.S. crop is produced here in North Carolina. Potato is not such an important crop across the US, but it's a very important spring production crop, around third or fifth, depending on the year, in terms of potato production for the chipping crop, so it's really important. Uh, sweet potato ranks first in vegetables in North Carolina, second is potato. Uh, we plant roughly about maybe 95 to 100,000 acres of sweet potatoes in North Carolina now, uh, roughly 12 to 14,000 acres of potato, depending on the year, and these are the rough, the rough values. So all this is to say that, that sweet potato in particular is a very important crop to North Carolina's ag economy. Uh, potato's also important, but I'm gonna focus a little bit more on sweet potato today because I have a larger footprint with sweet potato. Most folks find their way to our doorstep if you're working on sweet potato uh, because of the importance of the crop to, to our economy and the strengths that we have here as a, as a university in sweet potato. A lot of interesting changes have occurred to crops since I first arrived at NC State in 2006. Uh, everything has trended upwards. Our acres harvested has tripled, if not almost quadrupled. Our production per hundredweight has gone up and our yields uh, have gone up dramatically. I've never seen this occur in any other crop that I've worked with. I've, I've worked on a fair amount of crops, but I've never seen this in a lot of other crops. Uh, in 2005, one of my colleagues and I, the, the sweet potato breeder, Ken Pakota and I, released a variety called Covington. Uh, Covington's had a dramatic impact on the industry. I wish I could say that Covington led to this, to, to, to this huge trajectory and increase. It's had its role to play as a new variety, but actually a lot of different factors have come together to propel our industry upward, uh, most of which are effective marketing by our commodity association, the Sweet Potato uh, commission and our grower commodity association, a high quality seed system that was developed uh, here uh, with growers in North Carolina in collaboration with NC State, the development of new storage facilities, which enable us to store the crop year round and provide high quality product. So all these have kind of come together in the early 2000s, the early decade to really come together at the right time to propel our industry upward. 
Let me talk a little bit about Covington and the impact that it's had as a variety. Again, put this in the context of other things that have come together to propel the whole industry forward. So Covington currently occupies roughly 80 to 85% of the acreage that's grown in North Carolina. Uh, many of you will say, oh, Craig, that's scary. That's not good. And I would agree with you on that. Uh, but sweet potato production has a history of the dominance of one variety for a period of about a decade or maybe two decades to the next new best variety comes along. And then there's dominance of that variety. Uh, we're actively looking for a replacement for Covington. Uh, would I like to see a little bit more uh, diversified industry? Yes, but the history of industry is, is such a, is, you know, is like that. It currently occupies roughly about 40% of the U.S. crop. Covington's made a big difference in North Carolina. We went from 3,500 acres in 2005 to roughly 8,000 or to roughly 88,000 acres in 2019. And it represents a roughly around, around 240 million in annual farm gate value uh, over the last four years. That's a big value for a crop like sweet potato. It's also had a pretty big national impact because really our sweet potato industry in, North, in, in the US is fairly small, but our farm gate value is, is usually averaging out about $500 million a year and Covington's become the dominant U.S. export variety with roughly about 25% of the crop uh, across the U.S., maybe 35, 40% of our crop being exported uh, largely to the uh, European Union, uh, to England and to the EU. Uh, put this all together, and I never thought that I would be able to say something like this as a breeder when I started off 20, 20 years ago or when we first released Covington, uh, the accumulated value in farm revenue for sweet potatoes now tallies over $3 billion. That's the impact that a land grant bred variety, publicly bred variety, has had on the farm in terms of farm revenues, $3 billion, roughly over a 15 year period. So I got it leads me to ask the question in a larger context is sweet potato an orphan crop or is it an under recognized crop? I would argue that it's probably a little bit of both. Uh, and I'd like to share with you now some of the things we've been doing to kind of change this perception and to develop new breeding tools to facilitate sweet potato improvement, both here at home and globally. Now, let's take a look at Africa and recall briefly that figure that I showed you about the US and the North Carolina context. And what I'm gonna quickly jump to here is this line right here. This basically is a measure of genetic gain. And what you can see is that our genetic gains for sweet potato across the continent of Africa over the last roughly 20 years uh, have really been very poor. So that's kind of led us to discussions is how can we change this, this line here? How can we bend it upwards and increase genetic gains over a year so we can address uh, malnutrition and hunger and increase productivity in sweet potato in Sub-Saharan Africa. I'm gonna go back to this figure here and one might ask, well, Craig, why do you wanna do that in the first place? You know, what, what's the value? What, what's, what do you have that, that says that sweet potato can actually help this? Well, first thing I wanna point out is, is we understand that sweet potato is really an important crop across Sub-Saharan Africa. And a while ago, I found this map and I always find this kind of interesting. It simplifies things fairly substantially, but I want to just share it with you anyhow. This is the uh, FAO hunger map uh, that is for 2015. What it shows is the status of hunger across the, con the, across the globe, green areas, low hunger, red areas, serious hunger. And I think you will all agree that North Sudan, South Sudan, DR Congo, here, these are bright red, all right? Uh, these are just under reports for FAO during the period 2015. But if you trust me, uh, let's, just, it'll, let's just go with the fact that these are bright red. And what always strikes me is the overlap of sweet potato with this map, which suggests to me that it's not unrealistic to think that maybe sweet potato can contribute to incomes, uh, alleviation of hunger and improve micronutrition uh, across this swath of Africa. Now, I'm not here to say that sweet potato can solve the problem. It can't. 
Uh, and I'm not here to say that you don't have a similar map like cassava or maybe bananas, uh, maybe maize that might overlay in a similar fashion. But this is one point that I wanna make with sweet potato from this context that I think, we think we can make a rational basis for this. And I'll make an argument a little bit later on that perhaps it's a good income crop too, which can lift people out of poverty and send kids to school. Okay, so my journey with sweet potato improvement in Sub-Saharan Africa began actually with the McKnight Foundation Collaborative Crop Research Program, which was established back in 1993 uh, by the McKnight Foundation. McKnight Foundation uh, is, a, is a foundation based out of Minneapolis, Minnesota, uh, related to the 3M Corporation. Uh, and they established the Collaborative Crops Research Program back in 1993. And I was very fortunate to write one of the first grants that they funded on a potato project while I was a graduate student and postdoc at Cornell University. But I came to NC State and I inherited a funded project from my predecessor, Dr. Wanda Collins. Uh, and it was a great opportunity. The thing that I liked about the McKnight Foundation's perspective is that they promoted crop research partnerships between developing and developed countries. And the funds were awarded to the national programs in the developing country. And it was the national programs that decided who they wanted to reach out to for technology assistance and higher order research assistance. And we were fortunate that NACRI and NARO, the National Agriculture Research Organization of Uganda, reached out to NC State many, many years ago to ask us to join them in this project. And I've had a very productive collaboration with Dr. Robert Mwanga over many years now. Uh, and Robert actually wrote this grant and uh, uh, he actually funded his PhD research uh, through this grant. Uh, the McKnight Foundation funds project for longer term projects. We actually had a 15 year run with them uh, and it was led by a series of PIs, first Robert, while he was uh, at, uh, at NACRI. And then uh, he moved to SIP and it was taken over by Dr. Gretti Semakula. Uh, and so we've, we've had this long-term project and it really got my, my career started. I'll come back to Robert here in a little bit, but again, my first PhD student, and I dare say that Robert taught me a lot more about sweet potato than I knew when I first started out. Our goal, was to develop high dry matter orange flesh sweet potatoes uh, as a way to address vitamin A uh, deficiencies across uh, much of Uganda uh, and in Eastern Africa, and also to address some biotic constraints, major biotic constraints, uh, sweet potato virus disease, which is a, a combination of two viruses, sweet potato chloric stunt, sweet potato feathery models, which, which, which combine to produce this syndrome called SPVD, sweet potato virus disease rampant across uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. And also we wanted to work on this little beast right here, uh, sweet potato weevils. There's a couple of different weevil species across the continent. This is what they do to the storage roots when they infest them. They infest the crop at kind of late stages uh, during drought periods when cracks open up in the soil, they come down, they lay their eggs and the larvae burrow through the storage roots. If you're trying to store roots in the soil, uh, you often lose much of the crop due to sweet potato weevil two major constraints. A lot of other bio, biotic constraints in sweet potato across Sub-Saharan Africa, but these were two biggies that we focused on initially. Uh, NC State's role was to develop molecular genetic tools for sweet potato, sweet potato breeding. Uh, that was our goal. We funded at least four PhD students on this project, Robert, uh, Dr. Jim Carlos Cervantes, who's a breeder in France now, Dr. Uh, Bernard Jada, who's taken over the program from Robert, uh, or all of our PhD students and Garetti Samakula is a seed systems person we still work with. Uh, this just is for shock value. This is the first AFLP linkage map of sweet potato. Uh, we were able to place QTLs on it, but we weren't really able to use it to for marker assisted breeding. But it was published back in 2008 when we first started the project. We were using the tools that we had to drive the science forward uh, with what we had at the time. I'm pleased to say that while we were doing the molecular research at, uh, at NC State, the team in Uganda was forging ahead, developing new varieties. And there have been a lot of varieties released by the NACRI program over the years uh, in collaboration with, with our partner, SIP, 
Uh, several of these here are high dry matter orange flesh ones. Uh, Vita has gotten a lot of notoriety. This NASPOT 10 is very good too. Uh, but the work continues and we're still trying to, to improve varieties. Some of these varieties like Vita, NASPOT 10 and a few others have kind of had good impact on the ground in Uganda, uh, but they're not as widely impacted as we'd like to see. And we have more work to do. We've done great work in Mozambique also uh, and made impact there too. But I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of focus on these other things right now. Uh, around about 2008, a new player came to the ground who was working in international agricultural development, namely the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And because of my role in the Gate in the McKnight Foundation project, uh, I became involved with the Gates Foundation as they were trying to decide whether they wanted to fund a much larger project on sweet potato improvement with the International Potato Center. Uh, long story short, they funded a, uh, it's actually, it was a 10 year project called the Sasha Project, uh, Sweet Potato, Sweet Potato uh, Action for Security and Health in Sub-Saharan Africa. The, the, the acronym is SASHA. This is a picture at the kickoff. And this project made major progress in population development and varietal selection, in developing and starting seed systems in Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, they explored certain delivery systems to get these high uh, biofortified sweet potatoes into villages to address vitamin A. And most importantly, they established uh, three management and sweet potato support platforms around the continent, uh, one in Uganda, one in Mozambique, and one in Ghana. Uh, this project has done stellar research. And what I'd like to point out to you is that three of the 2016 World Food, Recip World Food Prize recipients are standing in this photo. Uh, namely, Dr. Jan Lowe, who's still with SIP, Dr. Maria Andrade, a SIP breeder in Mozambique, leads the team there, and Dr. Robert Mwanga uh, led the team in East Africa for SIP in Uganda, uh, just recently retired. Uh, I'll do a little bit of horn blowing myself. Uh, two of these right here, Maria and Robert, are graduates of the Sweet Potato Breeding Program here at NC State. Uh, Maria worked with uh, uh, Wanda Collins, and then of course Robert was my first student, and I was extremely proud to be in the, in the audience that day when they received the uh, the World Food Prize. It's, it's a very well deserved recognition for all of the hard work that they've done. All right, but at around 2012 or so, uh, we all had a big conference at the Gates Foundation and realized that this curve wasn't changing fast enough, and we felt that with the establishment of this platform, we now needed to think about developing next generation breeding tools to drive sweet potato improvement. Uh, that discussion led to the genesis of this project called the Genomic Tools for Sweet Potato Improvement. It was a five-year project uh, that was funded in 2014. Uh, it's a fairly large scale project for sweet potato, probably the largest genomics project ever funded for sweet potato consisting of 20 PIs, seven institutions, six countries, four continents, 15 time zones. Uh, and I was asked to lead that project. And I'd like to share with you a little bit of that right now as to where, where, what we did with the GT4SP project. That project has now finished and that project is, a, is, is being followed on by the Sweet Games project, which is, which is led by, by Hugo Compost at the International Potato Center. And I think that Hugo's probably gonna tell you a little bit about that project in his, in his lecture uh, next week. Uh, the components of the GT4SP project were really simple. We wanted to develop a reference genome for sweet potato. We wanted to develop bioinformatics uh, infrastructure around this reference genome. We wanted to develop new uh, sequencing SNP development platform for sweet potatoes so we could develop lots of SNPs at cost in a short period of time. And the platform that we use was genotyping by sequencing. All of this data has to be managed some way. So we had to develop a database environment to wrestle down with the bioinformatics, all of the high throughput phenotyping typing that we were doing and all the genomic information. Uh, we also needed to train next generation breeders. So there was a training component both on the ground in Africa and actually here at NC State where we train breeders 
at NC State, and they're now working back in, in sweet potato in sweet potato in Sub-Saharan Africa. The collaborators on the project were at Boyce Thompson Institute at Cornell, two PIs. I'll go into those people in a little bit. Michigan State, University of Queensland, and Australia, International Potato Center in Lima, Kenya, Uganda, and, uh, and Ghana. Biosciences East in Central Africa at the Ilri campus. The National Crops Research Institute in Uganda, NACRI, and CRI, the Crops Research Institute in Ghana. Okay, I'm not gonna go into big details, but a couple of the outcomes of the GT Forest project is that we now have a reference genome for sweet potato. Uh, we couldn't construct a reference genome at the time out of the hexaploid cultivated sweet potato. So we opted to, opted to go to the nearest close relatives of sweet potato, Ipomoea trifida and triloba. Uh, we have found that we can order markers and we can use markers and orient them in the, in the trifida and the triloba genomes. Uh, primarily the trifida is the better genome to work with. And in our mapping populations, uh, what we've been able to do is to use these as a source of alignment, uh, ordering, and understanding the complexity in the, in the sweet potato genome a little bit better. We've now progressed to the point now that we're actually actively thinking about developing a pan genome for sweet potato. Uh, we're in the process of, of, of uh, developing reference genomes for two hexaploid clones. I won't go into that right now, but this kind of set the stage for those larger, uh, those larger efforts. Uh, we have a genome browser that's managed by Robin Buell at Michigan State University. I should say that Dr. Zhang Jun Fei at Boyce Thompson Institute at Cornell led this effort right here, along with Robin, uh, who is annotating and decorating the reference genome right here. Uh, so you can go to that. There's a, this, we're adding new information to it all the time. Uh, we're breeders. We realize the value of genetic populations, not only for examining uh, diversity uh, and making varieties, but for, for using as a tool to, to develop new algorithms uh, to benefit sweet potato. And this Mwanga diversity population, uh, which is made out of 16 clones in an eight by eight dialel population, uh, actually is the sweet potato analog, if you will, of the maize NAM population. Uh, so we're doing a lot of work on this right now. We have extensively phenotyped it and we're right in the process of SNP genotyping it as we speak. In fact, we hope that Intertech is going to send us the first test plates uh, here at NC State here sometime this week for us to do some, some work uh, on genotyping. We've learned a lot through some of the populations that we've looked like already with this. We now understand a lot more about the uh, inheritance of beta carotene and carotenoid biosynthesis in sweet potato than we first started out with. Uh, we've generated a lot of great uh, mapping and breeding populations in Africa and also here in the US as breeders. Uh, here's a couple of pictures just to give you a sense of what things look around, around the globe. Uh, remember now, sweet potato is a clonely propagated crop. So we invested a huge amount of time and effort in developing virus indexed uh, uh, virus-free materials uh, to send around the globe of our mapping population. SIP led that effort from Peru. We sent the materials out from Peru, uh, both to East Africa and, uh, and West Africa. Uh, this is just a quick picture of one of our marquee mapping populations called the Beauregard by Tanzania or BT mapping population. Give you an example of some of the segregation that's occurring in this population. Uh, this population started out with about 350 clones. We're now down to about 314, depending on, on whose hands they're in. But we've, we've done a lot of great work with this one. Uh, and it's led to some deeper, deeper, much deeper knowledge in terms of quality traits, in terms of uh, what makes a sweet potato flavorful, uh, what factors are influencing starch, dry matter, beta carotene, sugar contents, some of this has been recently published. Uh, we have major QTLs that we've identified for a lot of these important quality traits. So we've set the, the platform for that. Uh, here in North Carolina, we have a newly reduced 
a, nemat a newly introduced nematode called the guava root nematode, which is causing great havoc with our industry. Turns out that Tanzania, which is a African land race that we brought to the United States for our mapping work a long time ago, is resistant to all nematode species tested to date. It's very unadapted to North Carolina. Uh, and I would never, you know, uh, it's, we're, we're sort of reluctant to use this as a source of resistance, but we found uh, really broad spectrum resistance to both Southern root knot nematode and guava root knot nematode in this population. And they look to be single gene traits uh, on different linkage groups. Uh, these QTL here are huge QTL explaining roughly 50 to 65% in, uh, in nematode resistance both as eggs and galls measurements. And these are probably, my expectation is that these are, this is a single dominant gene here on linkage group seven. Uh, another single dominant gene here for guava root, not two different genes, but our resources that we now have now are allowing us to develop markers for these. And I think these will be probably our first markers for sweet potato to use in a breeding population. Uh, and we'll understand a little bit about these traits with the resources that we have. Of course, uh, a lot of this has to be managed. Our database is managed by, by Lucas Mueller, who's a developer of what we call the breed base, uh, a suite of breeding, uh, sweet potato, or, or of, of, data, of breeding databases. Uh, we call our sweet potato base. And a lot of the programs here in the US, uh, SIPs, all SIPs breeding programs, and several national programs now, certainly our partners are, are actively using this database to manage our data and keep it, it track of our trials. It's a continual process, and, and this has really, really been a helpful part of it. Uh, so we've done that too. Uh, we've had a lot of great meetings, both in country, uh, you know, global. Uh, here's the GT4S team visiting Nakri in 2017. Uh, and we've had great meetings here at home too. I gotta say, I tear up a little bit over this picture right here because I so loved having the team back at, at NC State. And I so love bringing them over for a great barbecue at our house. And I so much look forward to those times coming back again. I need to collect myself a sec. Uh, but we've had great meetings, uh, both out of the country, but also our colleagues from, from external have come and we've shared and we've learned and we've, we've had wonderful times together. All right, I'm gonna kind of bring it home here. Uh, so in 2019, the Gates Foundation decided, and I think it was a wise decision uh, to combine the Sasha project, which done excellent work on the ground in Africa with the genomic tools for sweet potato improvement project, project to combine these two projects into a new project, which is managed by SIP called Sweet Gains. Sweet Gains stands for Sweet Potato Genetic Advances in Innovative Seed Systems. And our value proposition is that we need to really put the breeders together very tightly with the seed systems people and with the management people to now begin to drive these new varieties out across the continent. Our focus has changed a little bit. It's not all orange flesh sweet potatoes now. It's the whole spectrum of sweet potatoes. And sweet potatoes come in a wide range of shapes, sizes, and colors. So it might be white fleshed ones that are very popular uh, locally. Uh, but if we need orange fleshed ones to address vitamin A nutrition, which we do, we have those too. So we broaden our breeding platform. Uh, that was funded from 2019 to 2023 as a three-year, $15 million project. The goal was to orient us with some of the other RTB crops, as we understand with the Gates Foundation. And we're hoping that in 2023, we can move forward with a larger project uh, as, as long as we do good work with this. And I think that Hugo will talk about Sweet Gains a little bit next week, but stay tuned for this project. I think we're engaged now, we set the platform and, and now the next goal is, is to actively use it uh, as a tool to facilitate breeding. Okay, so with that, I want to change, change gears just a little bit uh, and kind of look back a little bit in, in terms of 
you know, how sweet potato breeding and the international collaborations have gone. And as I sort of thought about putting this last slide together, I think we've made some really great impacts uh, across these uh, six different areas. One, in terms of training. Uh, we've trained great students here. They've gone back to contribute in their home countries, but we've benefited greatly uh, through the knowledge that they've generated. The team has developed a reference genome, both a first generation reference genome at the diploid level and a hexaploid level. Uh, and this really allows us, it opens up so many new opportunities in sweet potato that we just didn't have before. So with this opens up great opportunities, not only for just breeding, but also for marker assisted breeding, new ideas in gene editing, et cetera. So the, the, the table's set. Uh, we now have a very robust SNP genotyping platform. We call it OMSEQ. We're working on OMSEQ array, which is kind of a hybrid between GPS-based SNP development and, and uh, a, a chip-based uh, SNP uh, developed by Bodhi Olukulu at University of Tennessee with the help of Andy Balsiger, our director of NCSU GS, GSL here at NC State and myself. The team led by Xiaobang Zhen, uh, Marcella Molinari and Guillerme uh, da Silva Pereira. Uh, now Guillerme is in, in Brazil at, uh, I forget the name of the university. I apologize, Guy, if you're on the uh, University de Selva. Uh, they've developed new polyploid mapping and QTL analysis, analysis strategies that are specific for polyploids. This is a first and was needed for the polyploid breeding community. Uh, Sweet potato, potato, strawberry, uh, cassava, not a polyblade, but highly, hex, high, highly heterozygous, bananas, a complex polyploid, all need these. And uh, they've really helped to drive the science forward. We've developed high quality breeding populations uh, in Africa and across the globe. And again, we've developed these robust databases and new means of electronic data capture through the Sasha project and the RT and the and the GT4SP project over the years. Uh, I would argue that all of these, this spectrum of advances are benefiting my own breeding program here. Uh, they're benefiting breeding programs across the globe. And it's been a really win-win for all of our programs. Uh, we would not have been able to do this at NC State had we not had our inter international collaborations and our international our funders who are interested in, in addressing global grand issues. Uh, so I would say we've been able to harvest a lot of opportunities and we've actually found great value in this underutilized crop. I think these tools are gonna help take it even further. Uh, so with that, I wanna sort of stop. I wanna recognize all of our funders that have helped us over the years. Uh, what I would like to point out is, is our foundational funding comes from our grower community here in North Carolina, the Research Stations Division, North Carolina Sweet Potato Commission, Sweet Potato cert Certified Sweet Potato Growers. Got the same thing over here on my potato side, but we increasingly have large corporations that we work with now and all of the international centers that we work with and our land grant collaborators. Uh, it's a team effort and we have really benefited from that. And for that, I am very, very thankful. Uh, and I've really enjoyed the interactions we've had over the years. Uh, and they've really helped to drive the science forward, at least in sweet potato, uh, both globally and, and locally. Uh, Carlos? Yes, I, thank I you so I much, can, Greg. I can stop right there. Uh, you wanna stop? Sure, uh, uh, I can read some of the questions that have come up through the q and I can uh, do great, it. Yeah, great presentation, Greg. And uh, we have uh, about 10 minutes for questions. I'm gonna start with the ones that are read in the Q&A. Um, one of the things is, uh, the first question is why sweet potato yields have increased uh, faster than other crops, Greg? Let me just get my... Yeah, yeah, get some water. I'm trying to get my share to stop here real quick. Oh, okay. That's okay. There you go. There we go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good. Perfect. So why did sweet potato yield has increased theoretically faster than other crops? 
I don't know the sweet potato yield per se has a sweet potato yield in with with respect to Covington uh, it, it jumped quite a bit solely as a factor because sweet potato does a thing called pack out. It produces a more uniform crop and it has a lower G by E than its its predecessor. Its predecessor was a, was a, was a line called Beauregard. Uh, so uh, what happened? Remember, sweet potatoes is a is a you know horticultural crop, and very often the yield doesn't have to drive up. But in our case, our pack out was about forty percent better on average than uh, Beauregard, and that led to dramatic increases in yield. Couple that with better cultural management, uh, and also good clean seed really helped to all come together to increase yield and increase that genetic gain, if you will. Okay, thank you. Uh, you, you talk about the uh, challenge of adoption of the uh, deep orange sweet potatoes. This one question here about the attitude that used to be that poor women grew orange, uh, deep orange sweet potato. Is that changing? That's the question. You know, I, I, I would like to say that yes, it is changing. It's not changing nearly fast enough. But I think one of the really underrecognized opportunities in sweet potato, uh, say in sub-Saharan Africa, is that that money aspect, the income aspect. Uh, I think the farmers generally can command a slightly higher price uh, for the orange fleshed ones, but they might not be the first preference at the market. Uh, so there's a little bit of a push pull there that I, I think that people need to address. Sure. Another question is why has uh, sweet potato advanced so much in North Carolina, not in Louisiana, which used to be the number one sweet potato state? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I think that our industry has has really really uh, gelled, uh, and the marketing the marketing uh, aspects have come together. Our storage facilities uh, have been invested in heavily. I'd like to say that that NCSU has had, uh, you know, a significant, you know, level of, of help in that area. Uh, LSU has had some really tough years where major hurricanes have come through, and really kind of devastated their their, uh, you know, their sweet potato production in certain years, and they they've had a couple of years where it, where it's really been very very difficult. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think everybody's kind of acreage has gone up a little bit. Mm -hmm. But certainly North Carolina's growers have been very, very aggressive. Uh, they've been very, very creative. They've been very entrepreneurial uh, in that export market that they've tapped into also, largely because of the proximity of our ports, sure. I, I think has helped all that come together. Also, uh, to me, uh, one of the important things is the alternative uses that has been come up with sweet potatoes nowadays is very common to find sweet potato fries as an alternative to potato chips, which I think is interesting. I think you make a very good point there, Carlos, is that adding value to sweet potato mm -hmm. uh, has been critical to, to the growth of the industry as a, ho as a whole yeah. and as a means to finding value in, in the crop. Uh, I, you know, I view that partly through my lens as a potato breeder and I see you know, what we do with potato. Mm -hmm. I also see that almost all the major potato processors have seen the opportunities that exist in sweet potato, and now they very they're often doing sweet potato also. Yeah. yeah. Question from uh, Ghana, and I imagine you will probably refer uh, John Eleblu to see because he's asking about how can the uh, Waki can collaborate to multiply virus-free sweet potato lines to deliver to farmers. Oh, I think that's a great, I think that's a great question. Uh, I've lectured at Waukee many times and I, I said, hey guys, good to see you. Uh, I would refer that over to maybe CRI and why don't you reach out to uh, Victor Amonkwa at CRI in Kumasi and see what they're doing. He, he's recently, you know, received his PhD here from NC State and he's back in uh, Kumasi at CRI. That would be very good. Uh, we have a very high quality micropropagation unit, and we've we've uh, we've brought people from around the globe here uh, to learn about uh, how we do it at the MPRU. Uh, LSU also has a very good seed seed program too. 
High quality seed is a really important part of the whole equation. As in most uh, vegetatively propagated crops. Uh, yes. A question about alternative methodologies for breeding other than crossing and recombination like mutagenesis. Maybe we can put gene editing into this context too. Yeah, I, I think I, I'm not so uh, bullish, if you will, on mutagenesis personally. I could be wrong on that one. But I feel uh, that we've now come to a point where we have the resources uh, that we can realistically think about doing gene editing in sweet potato. Uh, the major constraints are going to be this, is doing it in the genotype that you want. I view gene editing as back crossing uh, in inbreds or in hybrids. We can't do that in sweet potato as, uh, you know, according to the genetics. Uh, and we need to do that. And I think there's opportunities for that uh, there's opportunities for that in, uh, in sweet potato. Uh, so there's a lot of yet really good work to be done, but I think we have the requisite resources to begin that discussion more seriously. Mm -hmm. Good. Why is uh, purple sweet potato not as good in taste as uh, white or cream or yellow? Depends on, your, de depends on your culinary preferences, I might say. Uh, and some people really like them. Anthocyanins at high levels are a little bit bitter, mind you, though. Uh, but the texture and the flavor is uh, is different in the, in the purple flesh sweet potatoes. I've had some purple ones that I really like that have kind of a nutty flavor, uh, that have a nice creamy texture. Uh, so they're out there. But it, it really does it. Uh, be, beware with sweet potato. It has a huge range of flavors and textures and ranges of sweetness uh, that that really. I, I say represent opportunities uh, for new new markets. Okay. Um, any uh, thoughts about compatibility when you do dialleles? Uh, how, how you check for that? We know the sweet potato is highly self incompatible, but is there problems with compatibility across genotypes? Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's another great it's another great question. And what I what I would say is that uh, within the within the last five years because of the advent of the markers that we have, and because we can now sort of understand uh, what crosses are actually occurring in, in our, formerly in our polycross breeding nurseries, uh, and what we know about genetic gain, and, you know, in terms of what we could do between a paired cross and a half sip cross, uh, our philosophy is really changing. Uh, and incompatibilities are, are huge. Uh, what you'll find in sweet potatoes, very often the cross you want to make, you may not be able to make. Uh, so still overcoming those issues, I, th I think are going to be hurdles to move forward on. Uh, I think we have germ germplasm and new tools where we might want to seriously look about uh, going after those incompatibility loci and breeding them out. Uh, and that's something we've been actually thinking about in, in, the, in our program. Right, I'm gonna entertain one more question and uh, we'll see how we address the rest of the questions uh, following this seminar. But the last question is, uh, uh, any thoughts about releasing uh, multiple varieties in Uganda instead of having one dominating the landscape uh, of the uh, Sub-Saharan Africans? Yeah, uh, in, in the course of my you know, career, I've, 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 I've always hesitated in making, you know, uh, using my lens here as a, a breeder in, say, North Carolina for Africa, uh, I, I think it, it depends. Uh, when I go to, say, Uganda, and I've, I've been there a few, a few times, you know, it used to be several times a year for many years going, um, the, the cultural, the ecological, uh, the geographic niches are so broad that uh, I wouldn't be surprised that there's, you know, there's, there, there are a lot of land races that persist. Uh, so I, I see a tapestry of varieties persisting there. But the thing that has surprised me about sweet potato uh, is that it has the potential for broad adaptation. Uh, and so there, there might be something like that that hits but I think the fabric of, of Uganda, if you will, if I, if I could refer to it that way, is such that it's, it's more subject to 
weaving it with a you know a wider tapestry mm -hmm. if you will of sweet that potato varieties than just one one color okay hey craig a big thanks for your presentation and, and not only my name but probably the name of all participants we already have a few comments here about your great presentation thanks so much for your attendance uh we have people even from india which is amazing that they stay up uh or woke up very early in the night to, wow. to hear this seminar uh the recording is going to be available to all the people that has registered uh and it will be in our website uh, stay tuned for that uh i need to give recognize the music we play at the beginning for future seminars please try to join us five minutes before we have a series of photos that relate to agriculture food production and plant breeding with music local music so try to Kind of brand this seminar in that way thanks so much for the help of brandon janine and anthony uh it's been great and next thursday we will have hugo campos from seed talking about bringing innovation uh, an innovation perspective to agar and and, and plant breathing until then thank you so much and i will see you next we will see you next week at the same time uh in this same um uh, link okay thank you so much thank you craig and thanks everybody <laughs>